Hey, what's up, people? Hope everyone's doing well. Today, we're going to be talking about elements of art and focusing on color. And if you want to learn how to turn your artistic weakness into your strength, check out artprof.org, where we have lots of free resources, tutorials, critiques, art dares, and all that good stuff. So Clara, why don't you get us started on our topic for today? Yeah, this video is part of a series of videos focusing on the elements of art, which are basically the foundation of making an artwork. So we're gonna focus on color today. And it's a little ridiculous to say that we're gonna cover color in about 40 minutes. <laughs> we are not, but we are gonna give you a comprehensive look at what is involved with learning color so you know what's out there. A lot of people know pieces about color, but we're gonna tell you everything that you need to eventually figure it out. This is the first slide that I think is gonna help a lot of people. Anybody can learn color, right, Lord? <laughs> yes, I, I, I made you change this slide to say anybody can learn color. We were trying to say, oh, color can be easy. Color can come really quickly. No, it's not the case for most people, I think. But I think anybody can learn their own logic to color. And that, because everybody, most people, I shouldn't say, I shouldn't say everybody because some people, maybe some people are, are, are blind or low vision and that is very hard. But the general population has some sense of, of vision and color vision and thus can learn their logic of seeing and apply that to whatever work that they are doing. So we're gonna go over some of, the, some of those hierarchies in this stream. Tell us in the chat, who here has struggled with color in the past, who here currently struggles with color, and tell us why. Because I know, Jordan, a lot of people are very intimidated by color. Why do you think that is? I feel like color is a whole, it's a, it's a whole new universe. Like I remember when I was younger, uh, like maybe starting RISD and stuff, I was I would kind of say to myself, oh, I'm only gonna work in black and white. And the real reason was because I was too intimidated by color. And, you know, I see all these paintings and, you know, concept art and film, and I see the most beautiful work, and I couldn't really figure out why. I didn't know if it had to do with the color palette or if it was mixing color or, you know, how to get things to stand out. Like, there's just a lot to deal with there, and no one was explaining it to me at the time. And Lauren, I know because of your bright, colorful paintings, a lot of people might make the assumption that for you, learning color was not difficult, but you had your share of struggles too. Yeah, and I guess there's also an assumption there that when people see really bright color, they think, oh, that person really likes color. But what they're making that assumption on is just that that person uses a lot of saturated color. I would say that people that use muted color also have a love for color they just have a different love for a different part of the color spectrum and so i think that when you are looking you you decide what kinds of palettes are interesting to you and that is a good place to start maybe that is super saturated color or maybe that is working tonally or maybe that's working within like a a couple hues or complementary colors. You get to choose where you want to start. Katya says, so much. Currently, I feel like balancing saturation is a bigger issue than the colors themselves. And Denise says, I cannot ever mix the colors I need properly. It takes so long. There's just a million <laughs> factors to think about. And Jordan, I'd like to hear for you, was color hard for you to learn? Yeah, color was was challenging because there was a lot of uh, you know, there's a lot of things I wanted to do personally that I just could jump into. So, for example, with the shadow boxers characters, like a lot of their colors are super saturated, but I couldn't just jump into all the saturation. I had to build that up, and I think the the easiest way for me to learn was by studying photos, uh, learning just the basic fundamentals of how these things work and, and starting to see how I could use color to my advantage to create the images that I wanted to create. I think that's ultimately the key because you know, some people don't want to make really colorful stuff like uh, 
John Singer Sargent or Van Gogh or something. Some people like more muted palettes with, you know, little hints or accents. So, you know, just deciding what it is I want to do um, is also part of the battle too. Do you, that reminds me, do you want to hear a short color bullying story where yeah. I was the bully? Okay, so back when I was an undergrad, I really did love color and I thought that saturated color was the only color. And so in my class, there were two people in my materials and techniques class in painting. And one painted very classically, liked those Venetian reds and sap greens and all that. And the other one really liked to paint in grays and neutrals. And I called one of them a coward and the other one Blandy. And I said they only liked potato things. And I called him Blandy for like three years. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't realize that this could be hurtful to someone and also that it is extremely wrong. So these people probably don't like me anymore. But I just want to say, don't do that to people. All colors are valid. Anywhere you start is valid. Um, saturation is not king. That's all. Well, I was going to say, just because somebody uses bright colors, it doesn't mean that their work is better. Mm -hmm. You can use colors in so many different ways, and we're going to show you a lot of examples of that. So I think it's a great example of what a bully Lauren can be. <laughs> Can't believe you, birthday twin. What's up with that? You know, he's a bad person. <laughs> I think between the three of us, I'm definitely the one that has struggled the most with color. I still don't think I'm that great at it, but I'm not avoiding it like the plague, like I used to. And when I look back on it, I actually think the reason I had so much trouble is because I drew in black and white for so long. And I just assume that, oh, well, I have to be better at black and white first. And then when I'm good at that, then I will tackle color. But the issue is that actually made it harder for me. Jordan, does that make any sense? <laughs> oh yeah, that, that's exactly what I was saying before. It was like, when, when I when I got comfortable with just using black and white, I was like, yeah, I could just master this and I just won't touch color because you know that's for, that's another crowd or something like that. But the truth was for me, I really liked color. Like I wanted to do stuff that was fun and zany, especially wanting to go into animation. Like you, unless it's 1924, unless it becomes like 1928 again or something like that, then pretty much everything's going to be in color for animation. So it's, it's one of those things I think is incredibly necessary and it only heightens your skill set. Or I do stuff like this, or I'd be like, it's in color, right? <laughs> I used one color. And so I was a totally black and white and monochromatic artist, but I always had this feeling that, oh, I need to get better at color. And I struggled with it for so long. And it wasn't until I took Tony Janela's class, senior year in art school, it all made sense the way that he described it to me. And he said, basically, if you spend too much time working in black and white, basically what you're doing is you're training your eye to not see color. And he said, that's why I struggled with it for so long because I had been trying to basically cancel out my ability to see the color. And it wasn't until I did his crayon drawing technique where you use these super bright garish colors that it started to really work for me. And so it's a long journey to learn color and it's still a struggle for me. It's not something I am super comfortable with. Now, Lauren, what do you think about this question? Do you think that people should do black and white first to get a handle on value or are they gonna end up like me? Well, I think that it's probably the most common in, in classes where the teacher will tell the student to work with value first. I know in my first painting class, I worked with value, value being black to white, that tonal range. But I think that it, that kind of is reductive. It sort of misses the point a little bit. Color is made up of several different aspects. It's made up of value, which is the black to white. It's made up of saturation, which is the intensity to uh, gray. And it's made up of hue, which is, you know, all the colors of the rainbow, red to purple or blue or whatever. And so 
if you can isolate by tone and work in tone, but you can also isolate by uh, hue or saturation and get those same building blocks. And it's really important to work and isolate in all three to get a full understanding of color. So you want to do exercises in all three, not just value. I mean, Jordan, I know you did a lot of value stuff in advance. Did that help you or did it totally screw you up like it did with me? Uh, it it was t it was tough when I was first learning it because there's a difference between focusing and trying to see things in just black and white and then trying to see the same thing when it, you add color to it because it's like, like I said before, it's a whole new universe happening. And so I had a hard time understanding, you know, if you know, a red is in shadow, is that going to be darker than this blue that's in shadow? And, you know, trying to, and then I would have teachers come up to me and say, no, this one's actually darker. And so trying to learn how to see it, kind of like paint my numbers almost, um, was the toughest thing for me. Alisa says, I feel this so much. I used to use color so much, but once I got into black and white, I feel like I struggled so much to use color. I mean, I think if I were to go back and redo my art education, I actually think maybe I would just take the students, throw them into color, have them feel like their heads gonna were gonna explode, and then pull them back to value, and then put them back to color. I, I don't know that I believe in this whole, you have to do this first until you're ready for this. And I think about that, not just in terms of color, I think in general with art, there's nothing that has to be first all the yeah. time. So value, I think oftentimes, it is something that gets forgotten about in color because people are so mesmerized by colors that they forget, oh, wait a minute, value does have an important role here. Lauren, why do you think people forget about value? I mean, just as you said, color is really dazzling. I think the things that people are looking at first, at least the ones I look at first, are saturation and hue. I'm picking out the colors and naming them. I'm saying, hey, that's red. Hey, that's green. Hey, that's orange. These are all hues. And then the other thing I'm saying is, oh, wow, that's really bright. Oh, that's really like grayed out, blah. Oh, that's really bright. So I'm, I'm not as often thinking about the dark to light aspect of a color because the other things are so dazzling, but it is very important. And there are skills like you're showing here where you can put things into grayscale, say on your phone to, to bring that value back into play. Jordan, do you ever do this where you're working in color and then you make it black and white to check the value? Oh, all the time, um, especially when I was doing character design, um, because I wanted to make sure that the bright, you know, colors were, you know, they were as light as possible so they would stand out. And, um, you know, I, I think that the reason that's so helpful is because we also don't, I think a lot of people underestimate the power of a grayish color too, which is also another reason why people have issues with color because like Lauren said, everyone wants things to be super saturated and bright and really that's not always the case. And it ends up making the piece look a little bit more jarring, if anything. So, um, yeah. yeah. Shrina says, I don't like using black and white values in my paintings, and yet I don't know how to use colors as well, which makes it worse. I think with all this, Shrina, my suggestion, just do one thing at a time. Don't try to do everything all at once because it's very overwhelming. And you can just say to yourself, okay, for today, I'm just gonna work on value. And then the next day, I'm gonna work on saturation within the same piece. I just think trying to do everything all at once can be very overwhelming. This is what helped me. This was the concept that Tony Janello taught me. And it's such a duh concept. Like once somebody says this out loud to you, you just go, oh my God, what is my problem? But this was my issue when I was in painting class, I'd get so upset. I'd say, oh my gosh, I need to get that blue, the blue that the model is wearing for the shirt. I need to mix that blue. And I'd get so mad. I'd be like, I can't get that blue. 
But the thing is, that's not how color works. Lauren, can you explain a little more? Oh man, I was just having this issue in studio the other day. It was so crazy. Colors are very plastic. The perception of, and what I mean by that is that the perception of color, your perception and ability to name a color is really based off of the colors that you see around it. There's a whole scientific reason for that, about the rods and cones in your eyes and how those work and how they get tired or activated or whatever. We won't go into that, that's science prof. But basically, if you're putting a, I had a, a warm gray that I wanted to put into this acidy yellow underpainting. And I said, oh, hey, this is a warm gray. It's gonna look gray. No, it looked purple. It was so purple against that acidy yellow. It was crazy. And I just, I did a triple take. I was like, am I, is there something wrong in this paint? Did I, did I put down the wrong thing? No, it was totally the context. That chartreuse acidy yellow was so bright, so cold that it made that gray that was kind of warm look really warm. And by warm, I mean purple. <laughs> well, and I think the idea that solidified it for me was this analogy, again, stolen from Tony Janello. He told me that colors are like people and it totally makes sense because right now it's me, Jordan and Lauren chatting. But if I took Lauren out and I brought in Deep D, it would be a different dynamic because I do think that people adjust themselves a little bit depending on who they're hanging out with. Like my kids, they get so annoyed with me when I stream. They're like, why are you talking in that art prof voice? I'm like, I'm not gonna talk on the stream like I talk with you guys, but that's how it works. We affect each other. Jordan, do you see that analogy with color? Oh yes, definitely. Like you can take any color, right? Um, and, and put it in a, in a different environment. So let's say you have a, like a reddish color and you're putting that in a desert scene in the heat of the day, like that's going to have a certain effect. But if you suddenly take that same color and put it in a paint that's mostly black, then that's going to have a different effect too. So it really just depends on what's around it and what it is, and also the mood that you're going for. Um, especially in concept art, that's huge because, you know, you could like, let's like blue, for example, is one of those colors that can represent like either coldness or darkness or uh, being ominous. And depending on what your subject matter is, you can have a completely different feeling. And so every color is so powerful that it's, that's why we can't really go into it all that much in just one stream. <laughs> it's just, it's packed. Ariel says, my husband and his sister see certain colors as gray that I see as muted greens. That's the other thing. People have individual perceptions of color and the way you translate that into your artwork is very different. There's a lot of variables. And Cole, how perfect that I have the slide here from Joseph Albers' quintessential color theory book about the interaction of color. Lauren, have you read this book? I've never read it. I've just told people about it. Yeah, I, <laughs> I haven't read it either. I actually, my favorite books about color are not really about uh, color relationships themselves. They're more about like the social relationships with color. So my favorite color book is Chromophobia by David Batchelor. That's actually on our Art Prof website in the list of books if you want to go look it up. Um, another one is uh, The Secret Lives of Color. That's a great one talking about pigments and origins. Um, Again, we've got a whole list of these books on the Art Prof webpage if you want to go deeper into them or you want to buy them or something. Check them out at your library. Yeah, so I think the thing about colors and relationships, it's not about making the right blue. It's trying to create the group situation that will get the blue to behave a certain way. And so sometimes if I want to make the blue feel a certain way, I don't change the blue, I change the color next to it because it will completely shift my perception of that blue. So never think about colors in isolation. Like as we were talking about earlier, these are both brown, but which one is warm and which one is cool? Jordan, how about you? What's your take on these two browns? Uh, I mean, in this context, I would say the warm 
brown is the burnt sienna and the burnt umber would be the cool version. So. Although the burnt umber makes some great warm grays if you're mixing it with white. So that's a an area where it goes into a warm thing rather than a cool thing. Yeah, so I said in the context. I was right, like, right. <laughs> I, I got that. I got that birthday twin. I like this comment from Tiny Wolf, who says color is like the Wild West, wild and often oversaturated. I know it's just a lot to figure things out. And Uel says, I find video games teach the best color theory. I don't know that they teach the best, but it maybe is the best for you. Like Lauren, you learned color really through fashion. I learned color through natural light because natural light was when I started to see colors more deliberately. And so there's no correct way to learn color. It's whatever color is the best fit for your learning style. Yeah, and even Jordan. though- Huh? Go ahead. Oh. You, even though I learned color through fashion, I actually teach color generally to my students through movies. So Jordan, how about this color wheel? Do you find it useful? <laughs> uh, sometimes. Um, I I I think it's good to know like the complementary colors and you know split complementary and like those principles but i end up using colors that are like reddish orange or bluish green like i never use just flat out that color like that that's the only challenge for me i just feel like i see the color wheel everywhere but it's not that helpful <laughs> i actually think where it becomes helpful is with complementaries but all these diagrams and charts they do teach things, but I actually think, Lauren, what you said about noticing colors in movies, in clothing, somebody said video games, it makes it feel more real because these charts don't really say very much. Like I can show you this slide and say, well, these are the stereotypical cool colors, but it makes way more sense if we look at it in a movie still. So Lauren, this is mostly cool colors from this horrifying miniseries. Can you watch this? This was like the most horrible thing I've ever seen. But anyway, it's about Chernobyl, the nuclear explosion. And what do you think the cool colors do here, Lauren? It makes it feel really, first of all, very dour, very serious, which is uh, appropriate to the series. I mean, we're talking about many people dying of like a radioactive accident. So um, it sets the tone. It also brings it back towards a particular time period like this. This color palette is very much part of that uh, Soviet Russia thing that was going on in the, oh man, this was the, it was the early 80s or late 70s, I think. I, I think it was in the 80s, but don't quote me on that. Um, anyway, so you can use color to bring you back to like to to bring about a certain nostalgia or a certain uh a setting either place or time and create like a, a mood like something that you're supposed to feel and the thing is we're not saying oh cool colors always feel scary and dour for example jordan what's happening here uh well to be honest i actually haven't seen kill bill in a very long time but uh in fact you know, Uma Thurman, her character in the middle is, you know, fighting all these people. And, you know, I, I think what when Tarantino is doing here is he's pushing the psychological impact of color. I think that's really the biggest, like, for me, when I learned that color had psych, like that psychological impact and each color for me represents something different. That's when I really started putting these situations together and I could piece everything out. And I was like, oh, OK, so try using this in this scenario, you might get this effect. Um, or same with the Lord of the Rings here, it's like, you know, peaceful, dawn, you know, all these different things that we associate, but without words, it's just by what we see on the screen. Yeah, and I just would never make assumptions about how certain colors work because we saw Chernobyl where the cool colors really have this sour, really upsetting look like UL says, Look at the green tint, how it makes you think toxic.
But here with Lord of the Rings, this is so like warm and fuzzy. And so there's a psychology to color that in my opinion matters way more than any color wheel. I think for me, looking at movies and how they adjust the images, like in Lord of the Rings, they did a lot of digital color grading after they shot all the scenes. So that way the colors would actually feel more cohesive. Like this was not the actual color that they shot the scene in. They made it more blue purposefully to get a specific type of atmosphere. And warm colors too. I mean, people say, oh, these are warm, but is that really true, Lauren? <laughs> I mean, again, it's all, it's all relative, you know? I think the Chernobyl picture that I put into this, like technically it falls under yellow, but I would still call it a kind of a cold yellow. It's only warm for the rest of the show. Like, look at this, guys. Does this feel like warm or cool to you? I, I'd love to hear what you say, despite what our labels are on it. Well, this is the same miniseries. Now we're looking at the warm shots. Jordan, does this feel warm to you? What, what kind of, you have you seen this miniseries? I don't think you have. I, I've never even heard of it until about four minutes ago. <laughs> this is like scarier than any horror movie I have ever seen in my life. Like watching this miniseries, I felt traumatized. Okay, then I'm so horrible. <laughs> but anyway, Jordan, what's what's your take on the psychology of the still with the color scheme? Um, it just seems dark and evil right here for me. Um, and you guys can tell me if I'm wrong, but I just get the sense of um, being overwhelmed uh, with this. Since I, I don't know if it's connected with the fire that we just saw on the last slide, but I don't want to be this person here. I'll just say that. <laughs> I, 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 could, I could give you a, a spoiler if you wanted. I don't care. I'm not, I'm probably, I don't like being traumatized on purpose. So I probably won't watch the show. <laughs> well, that, that guy in the previous shot, I feel like it was colored really red like that because he eventually dies of, you know, radioactive poisoning and his skin peels off and all that stuff. Like, it's a badness. So no. this kind of is that sunburnt effect that your your skin gets really red. I mean, radioactive damage from the sun is a sunburn. So it's, that's part of that scene. He's putting out the radioactive fire there. So I guess I would just say, if you guys feel like you want to get better at color, a big part of it is just observing color in a number of different contexts and to ask yourself, what does the color do? Like, this is such a warm, fuzzy, he's got buns in the oven that he's making for dinner. Like you, you can almost like smell the hominess of the scene, but then this is <laughs> not the case at all. Like this is super stressful. So I would just consider that colors can change at any moment given any specific situation. All right, Lauren, what is color saturation in a nutshell? Color saturation is how intense and bright the color looks like to you. Bright is not a good word to use, I've been told, but um, think of like the greeniest green or the yellowiest yellow. That's probably a, the most saturated version of that color. The sweater I'm wearing now, this green is like the most saturated green that you can get or this orange. And I think the way to think about saturated colors is they're basically colors right out of a tube because the second you mix anything into that color, the saturation comes down. It doesn't matter what it is. And so Jordan, I think sometimes we tell people, hey, don't use the color straight out of the tube. Do you think that's why? Because we want the color to not be so saturated? Um, what do you, what do you, wait, what do you mean exactly? Well, I guess because oftentimes I'll tell students and I'm like, hey, you really got to mix the colors and don't use them straight out of the tube. And oftentimes it's because straight out of the tube makes everything hyper bright, which is oftentimes too much. Okay. So in that sense, yes, I would say, um, I always mix my colors. First of all, I, I primarily work digitally now, but, <laughs> but even back when I was doing more traditional stuff, I would often mix the colors. And if I didn't mix something or it came straight out of the tube, I would only use it for an accent 
or a highlight or something just really small that I wanted to draw the uh, draw attention to because um, I just think it makes it more interesting when you can play with different stuff. That's part of the reason we make art is to throw our own spin on things. I oftentimes feel like saturated colors are really bright, intense ones. I feel like they get all the attention. And it makes me sad because the really muted colors are sometimes what make the bright colors work out really well. Like actually one of my favorite artists is actually Morandi, who did beautiful muted paintings. They're very quiet. They're really subtle, but those colors matter. Why do you think people don't appreciate them, Laura, these muted muddy colors? They, well, they're like me. They associate them with blandness, even though that's wrong. <laughs> they're just, they don't stimulate your eye in the same way, even though they're absolutely necessary to the foundation of seeing and are necessary for the kinds of contrasts you're looking for in a work of art that um, guides you around effectively. And so really you want to be cognizant of the whole spectrum, the literal spectrum of colors that you're working with. Straight out of the tube can be useful for some things. And so can having like many muted colors, but you have to, well, you don't have to, but you should be aware of the kinds of combinations that you can use with all these things and try not to prefer one over the other or like really go to one and like totally diss the other. Like they all have a use. Maria says out of the tube, the colors are loud yelling at you. I don't like feeling like I'm being attacked. One rude being in the room I can take, but everyone is just overkill. Would you say that's <laughs> accurate, Jordan? That's amazing. I love that. I want to use that from now on. I hope I don't forget it, <laughs> but it's so true. It's like you, you don't want to feel overwhelmed by a canvas, at least not for me. I don't, I don't appreciate that. I want to be able to, to enjoy all the colors in their individuality. I need to frame this comment. Sorry, guys. Blandy Mirandy. I am using that forever now. Forever. That is fantastic. Mirandy's one of my favorite painters, guys, so it's okay. Whoops. <laughs> you just want to show it a second time. We, we know. <laughs> so the slow. whole thing about these muted colors and the bright colors you have to learn to balance them. Like, how do they work together? Because as Maria says, if everybody is shouting in the room, they all cancel each other out. But if everybody's whispering, you can't figure out anything at all. So a lot of it, I think, is about establishing a hierarchy, figuring out, okay, well, what piece of this is going to be muted? Is most of it going to be saturated with just a little bit of this? So Jordan, how do you explain how to figure that out, how that balance works. Um, this is actually a time where I really do rely on value. So like, for example, this image here, Guardians of the Galaxy, most of the image is very, very dark. Um, the key pieces that I look at that are standing out are the parts that are very bright purple. And you know that that's, a val that's totally a value thing um, and saturation as well as in the lighter areas. So I think about storytelling, I think about composition, um, you know, who or what I want to stand out the most. Shape also plays a role into that as well. So that that's where everything starts to merge, all the lessons we give you guys about composition and, and shape and blah, blah, blah. Like, it all kind of merges together at this point when I'm creating the image. Jane says, I look around the world and it's muted colors everywhere. I actually think we could use more bright colors in everyday life since I find them more joyful and I think we could use more joy. I think it depends on the person. I mean, I feel sort of overwhelmed when there's a lot of bright colors. Lauren, I know you love it. <laughs> and so again, it's like all personal taste. Lauren, do you have any tips for how to balance? I mean, is it just a 50-50 or does it just go case by case? I think it really is case by case. And I think that to find the right balance that works for you, you we would have to get into more conversations about 
content, I think, because color is a content conveyor. It is social, it, uh, it is emotional, and, um, you know, there are totally uh, important cases for like all different types of palettes, and they all have very specific connotations out there. So I would say do your research on the kinds of things that you like to paint or draw or are interested in just to create, and then look at the color palettes that are generated or generally associated with these things, or think about the types of moods you want to convey, and then put together some palettes for yourself. Alice is saying, I get nervous. I will go from muted to muddy fairly quickly. Well, this is an interesting observation because I have a much easier time if I start too saturated and then progressively tone it down. Because when I was in art school, I made everything gray. And if you start with gray, it's hard to push yourself towards the saturation. So that helped me. I'm not saying it's gonna work for everybody, but I do think the more you mix, if you're painting, ultimately things are moving towards becoming more muddy. It doesn't go the other way unless you squirt out new paint. So that might be a tip for those of you who wanna get started. That's also a, a kind of a medium specific tip too, I think, especially with oil paint, it's really easy to get muddy really fast the more colors that you start mixing together. Whereas with something like acrylic, the layers dry really quickly. So you can just put a new opaque layer on top and kind of start over more or less. Yeah, that's actually something I do when I paint digitally. Um, whenever I pick my colors, I actually tend to make it more saturated on purpose so that, because I know throughout the process, it's gonna you know get slightly more muted, slightly more muted. And if I can give myself a fighting chance, um, at least without having to make a new saturated layer and pushing that, all that and adjusting it. Jared says, it's interesting how colors push and pull. Warm colors seem to jump up at you or appear close. Cool colors are recessed and seem further away. That can be the case, but there's so many other factors. There's like composition and how the piece is articulated. I mean, color is just one piece of a very big package. So that's why it gets hard. So Lauren, in a nutshell, what are the complementary colors that we're looking at here? So there's purple and yellow, which is right there on the stream. There's blue and orange, like what's on my shirt right now. And then there is red and green, which is one of the top forms of color blindness is between red and green. So you got all of them right there. And this is the only time, honestly, that the color wheel I find is necessary <laughs> because it explains complementary colors. You just say, oh, they're across from each other. That's the only time it's ever helped me. Other than that, I really don't look at the color wheel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Same. <laughs> so Jordan, why do these combinations work so well? We're looking at red and green here. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I mean, when we say complementary, they're they're opposites, right? It, that's what you know. The whole color wheel thing is so important by recognizing what the opposite is. Um, you're able to create a much more vibrant piece and you're able to create that color contrast that is most impactful. Um, and oftentimes it really helps when you're trying to create a focal point like this image here, um, or okay, this one, <laughs> uh, where we have most of it being very cool and green and, or blue. And then we have Mushu who's just bright red. And so we immediately are drawn to him. And I don't remember the scene specifically, but I, I think he's talking. So it makes sense that they would frame it that way for him to be the focal point. I mean, I love complementary colors. I feel like I'm cheating sometimes <laughs> when I pick them as a color scheme because I'm like, yep, it's gonna work. I mean, I'm not saying it's gonna be a masterpiece, but there's a reason why people use them so much. Have you found that to be the case, Lauren? Well, sometimes I was going to say that sometimes it's very hard to get beyond the top cultural connotations that come with a pair of complementary colors. So I really have a hard time with red and green because that, especially on their top saturation, always ends up being Christmas time for me. <laughs> but um, every, my favorites are purple and yellow. I'd love to hear what you guys in the chat, what your favorite complementary color combo is that you start out with to build a piece of work. 
Well, Jordan, this is a painting that you did in Photoshop recently. Mm -hmm. What was it like balancing this crazy bright red with this yeah. more muted green? You know, I, so I started off with, you know, saturated, like super saturated colors, but I had to keep going in and brightening, rebrightening up that red because it just kept falling away and it wasn't creating that impact that I wanted. Um, most of the piece was really just kind of green. Uh, but I think the most difficult part was trying to find those places that were kind of in between, so like the center of her forehead or, you know, some of the um, the areas on her shoulder and stuff like those little areas where it's kind of a brownish, almost purple. Um, I think those were the most difficult for me to pull off. Arielle is asking, what do you think about contemporary artists who insist the real color primaries are yellow, cyan and magenta? What's your take, Lauren? It's a different type of palette structure, and I think that's cool, too. I love the artworks that I see that are using that as the hierarchy. I think that the same sorts of rules about a contrast of warm and cool and uh, hue, tone, saturation, all that still applies. You're just using a different set of three, and you're going to get a different uh, chromatic logic that goes with it. My feeling, Ariel, is who cares? Just do what works for you. Like, <laughs> I don't know. I just, people get so worked up about these things. And I'm like, okay, if you want to do that, good. This is what I like. I think the important thing is not to knock down anybody's means of working until you yourself have tried it. For, for me, I think what's key is the way I think about it is like, as long as it has an element, like if it's blue and orange, right? We're saying those are compliments. As long as it has an element of orange, so if it leans more towards yellow, that's still kind of got some orange in there. Or if it leans more towards red, it's still got the same thing. And I think of it that way because then I'm not stuck in the very concrete, you know, color wheel example that we've been showing. It helps me to broaden uh, my options. Now, another thing that a lot of people do is to create color palettes in advance. And Lauren, we do have this stream where you explain you have this incredible process for figuring out your color palettes in advance that you can all watch. But Lauren, why have you found these to be so helpful? My big issue when I was learning color, and honestly, it's still an issue, I still do this, is that I get so excited by all the colors that I try to use too many at most at once and then it becomes a cacophony of colors which is a bad place to be when you have too many because it's harder to reduce than to add so i like to start with the some main colors that i know that are going to be there like five colors and try to stay within the mix of those five and then if i'm feeling really pressured i can add a couple more but <laughs> i just use it as a focusing tool really Jordan, do you make color palettes? All the time. I don't start a painting without it. It, it helps me focus more. Uh, and I think that it allows me to just really hone in and trust myself and, and, and also just try and figure out how far I can really go with just a limited set. And like Lauren said, if there's ever a time where I need to adjust, like let's say I'm painting some sort of meadow and purple wasn't in my palette, but I want purple flowers, I can just throw that in there, you know? Um, so yeah, all about unification. Shell Ray says, I tried to create my own color charts with the paints that I have. I'm surprised by some mixes where colors I intend to use can be mixed by different colors that I would never try to mix. Well, I feel like a barbarian because I don't make color palettes. <laughs> I just paint and I feel terrible now. Maybe that's why you're having such a hard time with color, Clara. Maybe that would help. <sighs> You know, Lauren, I feel very bullied right now. I already have an inferiority complex about my lack of color skills. You're not making it better. I did not call you bland, okay, Clara? You can work in black and white. I can't do the things, the tonal things that you can do. We can just switch strengths for a little while. Anyway, we have more videos based on the other elements of art, like space and also line. And this Google Slideshow is also available. The link is in the YouTube video description below, and it's also on artprof.org. Artprof has a podcast. It's available on Spotify and also on iTunes. And in a little bit, Jordan and Lauren will be hanging out in the Artprof Discord, so you can all chat more about your little nerdy 
color tendencies or lack of color palette skills that I'm just gonna go cry about for the next half an hour by myself because some people couldn't stay off my back. <laughs> Subscribe to the channel so you can continue to grow and develop as an artist. And a big thank you to our top Patreon supporters. You are all so important to us maintaining this community. Thank you to everybody for watching and contributing your ideas. We'll see you next time.